So it's, uh, it's really a, a very deep honor for me to be here, and I, I, thank, uh, I thank you all for, for uh, coming in to, to fill up the room. Uh, from my vantage point, it's just incredible. There's not an open seat. There are people in the back. We won't tell the, uh, the, the gatekeepers. It's just, uh, it's just a really deep honor for me to be here, and I really thank, uh, thank Jim and, and thank Peter for uh, allowing me to be, be your speaker today. So much of what uh, we're, we're working on today involves this multi multidisciplinary linkage between what we do as specialists in our particular area of science and then how we relate our results to the general public. And in the, in the spirit of uh, Cesare Emiliani, I, I feel this is just such a great opportunity to speak to you today about the linkage between climate and life and uh, really to l use this as an opportunity to examine our own relationship with climate over our prehistoric past. So uh, just to uh, uh, expand a bit on, on what Peter had, had told you, um, Cesare's real contribution to our field, and the reason why he's considered uh, the father of paleoceanography is that uh, after his uh, PhD work with Harold Urey in the late 40s and early 50s, he had developed an oxygen isotope paleothermometer that allowed us, or allowed him rather, to uh, apply this new technique to uh, reconstruct changes in what he viewed as changes in temperature as preserved in foraminiferal shells in deep sea sediments. So deep sea sediments are the final archive of sediments uh, globally. So the, the ocean basins are these ultimate repositories of sediments around the world. And so Cesare, in his wisdom, saw the oceans as this potential archive, this encyclopedia of Earth history that would be, that had yet been untapped. And uh, what is now uh, really the, the, the root of our particular discipline in paleoceanography, he applied this as a way to reconstruct past climates uh, in a core from the Caribbean. And uh, this is a, a record that is uh, familiar to many of you, and if it's not, um, it should be. This is uh, the first application of the isotope paleothermometer. And what's so fascinating about it is that Cesare discovered in this core from the Caribbean that there were these regular up and down cycles of warming and cooling. Cooling, using his isotope thermometer on the order of something about 10 or 12 degrees centigrade during the ice age, warming up again during the last interglacial, and then that there would be several ice ages. In fact, in this core, he identified seven ice ages going back in time. And this flew in the face of this idea that there had been only four glaciations. And so Cesare realized at that moment that the deep sea sediment record could give us this much longer history of the longer term glacial interglacial succession of climate and as they say the rest is history as Lorraine Lazicki and, and, um, and Mo Ramo have made very clear to us now this is a uh, really a cornerstone of, of our particular discipline that there have been these long 50 odd uh, glacial interglacial cycles going back for several millions of years all of it has its root in this early paper uh, as uh, Peter mentioned, uh, an interesting link to this is that Cesare uh, had really thought big at this time, I think in particular once this new tool had come under, under, uh, under his hands, he said, just give me one long core of 100 meters and we can make much more science of it than a billion dollar hole to the moho. And this was a plan at the time to drill to the moho, which was going to cost a billion dollars at the time. Um, it was difficult in every way, it still is. And um, that gave birth to this thinking big idea and the birth of the deep sea drilling program with the Glomar Challenger. And we owe so much as paleoceanographers to the uh, existence of this program and I and others in this room have fought very hard to try to keep this program alive. For, so for all of you who've been part of that effort, um, I thank you and the community thanks you. It's just incredibly important. Uh, there's really nothing like it. It's the most successful international cooperation uh, that exists. One of the other uh, areas that Cesare worked on, he was really a classic Renaissance scientist. He was, uh, uh, he was uh, sort of intellectually unafraid, as it were, and he applied his knowledge and his expertise rapidly to some of the pressing questions that were of interest to him. So he was a very accomplished historian, a classicist, and he had a broad knowledge of Earth history as a geologist. And so he immediately set to work uh, applying this new toolkit to uh, investigating different but multidisciplinary problems. And one of them is I was actually interested to find out was actually on dating uh, the time scale of human evolution. And this was within one year of the publication of this classic paper in 1955. 
Within one year, he immediately saw the power of trying to place the fossil record as it was at that time, which is extremely poor, as we'll soon see, uh, trying to place the fossil record of human evolution within the context of global climate change. And this is really the first time this had ever been done. And it was really an eye-opening experience because all of a sudden there was now this very uh, independent check on this relationship between past climate change and its potential impact on, on uh, human evolution. So with that, I'll, I'll make a, a start. I, I do have to comment. I, I feel like this is sort of a wedding. I look out amongst the room, and so many of you are close friends, people I've spent a lot of time at sea with, people I've worked with closely over the years, and I'm, I'm really thankful that you're all here. And it's, a, it's really a great opportunity for me, too, to just uh, to give an overview of some of the, the work that actually many of you have been doing, because most of what I'm going to be doing today is featuring all of you. So climate and life have been intertwined throughout Earth history, and we need no better example of this than to look at the seasonal progression of vegetation and CO2 uh, over the planet. You can see the regular uh, waxing and the waning of the monsoonal rains across Africa. You can see the pulsing of vegetation uh, and algae in the ocean shown here in green. The, sea, the, the, the planet breathes carbon dioxide very much as a living, living entity unto itself. Also, the pole to equator diversity gradient, the, uh, the equator or the tropical regions are the engines of diversity, the, the, the uh, genetic and um, biotic diversity in the, uh, along the equator is many times higher than, the, than at the poles. And so we see that this, there's this fundamental arrangement on the planet that shouts this connection between climate and life. It's something that we shouldn't be surprised by, but it has obvious implications that when climate change changes, we should also anticipate that we should see a change in the biotic composition of the planet. So it's not an altogether unsurprising um, conclusion. For those of you who are earth scientists in the room, this is something that was taught to you in Earth Science 101, is that the Phanerozoic, the, 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 the fossil bearing record of, of the history of life on Earth, extending back now over 500 million years, was punctuated by five big mass extinctions. This is just one example of marine genera. This is redrawn from Raup and Sikorsky, fa the famous paper in 1982, where are these, there are these sharp drops in, um, in uh, diversity and, and uh, uh, species extinction that define these five big ma mass extinctions over the last 500 million years or so. The most recent one was the Cretaceous tertiary uh, boundary where non-avian dinosaurs became extinct. And that gave rise, fortunately for us, to the rise of mammals for the Cenozoic. And so we owe our existence very much to that most recent mass extinction. And so what I thought I'd do today is give an overview of a couple of different ideas. One is this idea that climate may have shaped who we are physically, and the other is how climate may have shaped us culturally. So as we ponder how our, our own climate right now is changing, and this is really the focus of so, many of your, so much of your research in this room, as we study our own changing climate and watch this natural experiment or this human man-made experiment go on on this single planet, I think it's useful to uh, either as a diversion <laughs> or, as a, uh, uh, or as just a, as an exciting thing to, to study the role of climate in shaping us. So I'm going to give two case studies here. I, I chose to do them both because they're both so fascinating. They, they involve entirely different groups of people. And it's this connection between disciplines that, uh, for me anyway, has just been so rewarding and enriching. The first will be this uh, exp exploration of this idea of how climate may have shaped human origins, looking back over a time scale of the last five million years or so. And the second topic will be examining how climate shaped us and our civilization. And this is a story that plays out uh, on the North African desert. <clears throat> so there are many narratives by which climate has been invoked to have influenced human evolution. One of the most persistent ones, and one that's still very active today, is this concept known as the Savannah Hypothesis. And the idea um, actually was first articulated by Darwin in, uh, in his uh, book on the origin of species, but it really took hold as a concept in the, in the uh, scientific realm 
uh, with the uh, discovery of uh, the Tong child in South Africa in the 1920s. And uh, Raymond Dart was uh, actually the, the person who described the fossil in an issue on, in Nature, actually published on my birthday, but back in 1925. Um, the, uh, his comment in this, I mean, it's incredible to read the article in part because as is the case for many of these early articles, um, it's really sort of geo-poetry. We have to keep in mind it's a single fossil from a single location. And as amazing as it is, the story that was woven from this is just mind-boggling. He says, for the production of man, a different apprenticeship was needed to sharpen the wits and quicken the higher manifestations of intellect. A more open veldt or grassland country where competition was keener and then it goes on to say, between swiftness and stealth, and it has this beautiful image of sort of man the hunter on the savanna. But, you know, what he's got is one specimen in one environment. And so this is where the idea was born. And still in many textbooks, you see this idea, and probably many of you have seen this as well, this idea that we sort of stepped out timidly from the forest and then stood out proud and, and dominated the, the grass savanna and began our sort of hunting career. And here we are at AGU. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do adequate justice to the fossil record, but I, one of the things, I actually participated in an NRC, a National Research Council uh, committee, evaluating the environmental context of human evolution. And we were able to get a room full of people like myself, climate folks, as well as uh, card-carrying paleoanthropologists to agree on a couple of things, which was amazing unto itself. Um, the, most, uh, the most robust thing that we are able to, to agree upon is not so much that there is this branch or Y or, or branching point in the human evolutionary tree, but rather that there are these clusters of speciation and extinction and behavioral adaptations that occur within pretty narrow windows of time. That is, the things that made us human all happened within the last five to seven million years ago. In other words, we were, our, our last common ancestor from mitochondrial DNA points to an, a, a, a branching time from the ape lineage at around uh, five to seven million years ago. And our journey begins at that point. So at what point did we become who we are? What point did we become basically big brains walking on an upright body? That's really what defines us as being human. Our brains are about four times too big relative to any other primate. The things that we were able to agree on in this uh, NRC report was that the appearance of bipedality, that is the appearance of, of not only of, of functional bipedality, the ability to walk on, on, uh, uh, upright on two feet, predates 4.4 million years ago, which is actually linked to this lower specimen here, Artipithecus romatus, uh, sometime between four and a half and maybe uh, five or six million years ago is the anticipated time when bipedality, functional bipedality appears. But it's really between something around three million years to maybe two and a half million years, um, more narrowly around uh, three to 2.4 million years. There are several things that happen in the, in the human fossil record that occur at this point. The first is the extinction of um, Australopithecus afarensis, or this red bar here, which would be known as Lucy. Uh, Lucy had a brain that was uh, much less than half the size of ours. It's quite short, sexually dimorphic. The guys are bigger than the girls. And, uh, and they became, that lineage became extinct around 2.9 million years ago. And within a few hundred thousand years, which is shown by this gray bar, a bunch of really interesting things happen. The first of which, and we're not sure who made these, is the first appearance of any tools of any kind. They're stone tools, crude choppers, known as the Oldowan complex, that date to around 2.7 million years ago. Also, we see two new and completely different lineages that appear. The first would be these uh, yellow guys here, which is known collectively as Paranthropus. Uh, it's easy to think of these guys rather as the sort of linebackers of the human family tree. Uh, they were not uh, especially successful. In fact, they, they, they met with a demise uh, in the uh, early Pleistocene. They were distinguished by having really large chewing teeth. They're, they're known sometimes as Nutcracker Man, and if you look at a guy's thumb next to you and have them do that, that was a, the size of their chewing um, surface on their, on their molars. So they're basically just chewing machines. Really, they're uh, a factor of two bigger than our own. <clears throat> they, 
They also had a sagittal crest. If you guys feel, and it's always fun for me to do this, but you can feel the top of your head. You hopefully don't have one of these. They had, they had a sagittal crest that was actually for um, actually powering the jaw to accomplish this nut cracking, this chewing um, intensity. And so uh, Paranthropus uh, is this lineage here. They're very distinct both physically and uh, also representing an increase in cranial capacity. But really, this is the first appearance of our lineage, Homo. This is the first appearance of our genus comes in at around this time as well. So there's a bunch of things that are happening within a fairly narrow window of time. The other second cluster of speciation and extinction and behavioral events is sometime between 1.9 and 1.6 million years ago, which, means, which includes the extinction of the early uh, Homo lineages and the emergence of Homo erectus, sometimes this has been called the lineage that you wouldn't make a double take if you saw them on the subway. They, are, uh, they were upright, very tall, uh, they had large cranial capacities. Um, and uh, this is also the first appearance of biface blades. So these are much more sophisticated tools that appear around 1.8 uh, million years ago. And then this is also the first time that we ever left Africa. It's the first time we see any evidence for hominins outside of the cradle of evolution in Africa. So there's a lot happening at these two nodal points, and so it's a good question to ask, what's so special about these times? And for a long time, and this, I, I have to extend, from, from Raymond Dart's initial paper back in uh, 1925, well into the late 80s, we really didn't have a good answer to this. We really had no idea how African climate had changed. And it's really thanks to some incredible heroes who are here in this room today that we now know what's, what's going on. It can be summarized as sort of two equal uh, processes happening at the same time that are superimposed on each other. How they interacted is actually a current uh, uh, point of uh, concern or question. We, we don't know how these things were, were linked over time, but we do know that they both, they both co-occurred. The first is the occurrence of these orbitally paced wet-dry cycles. So, when you think of this sort of seasonal progression of the vegetation across Africa, imagine that at an orbital scale, and that would be sort of an accurate uh, view of how African climate has varied over five million years. It's just been these 20,000 year pacing of wet-dry cycles. Superimposed on that, we now have very good evidence that there was this long-term shift toward an increase in the uh, arid adapted or C4 grassland expansion that occurred at, a rough, at, at roughly around uh, three to two million years ago. So in, that's indicative of increasingly more open and arid conditions. So what I thought I'd do is just give you an overview of the evidence that supports these, these positions, and, uh, and then you can see for yourselves where we stand. This is a seasonal map of vegetation from the NDVI um, uh, NASA uh, satellite, and you can see very clearly boreal summer, Boreal winter, boreal summer, boreal winter. The rain is feeding the vegetation, and that's just following the zenith angle of the sun as it goes from boreal summer to boreal winter. So the story in equatorial Africa, or in subtropical Africa and in East Africa, is the sweeping of these rains as paced by the monsoonal circulation. This is a slide from uh, Bill Rudiman, my, uh, my doctoral advisor. Uh, his book on Earth's climate, past, and future. For those of you who teach in this, uh, in this general field, it's an excellent resource uh, with uh, graphics available online. This is uh, an, a, 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 a chart that shows uh, the relationship of the African monsoon and how it responds to orbital forcing. So the Earth's orbit has three uh, main uh, elements of variability. Uh, the first is orbital precession, and this is the one I'll be focusing on, which, is, which regulates the Earth-Sun distance and the season at which we have our closest pass to the Sun. So today we have our closest pass to the Sun in boreal winter, but, uh, and, and for that reason the seasons are relatively damped. But one half of one of these cycles ago, 10,000 years ago, boreal summer was aligned with our closest pass to the Sun, and so the Northern Hemisphere got about 9% higher summer radiation at the top of the atmosphere than it does today. Because the African monsoon is forced by this insulation uh, gradient, or this actually the, the pressure gradient that results from this insulation heating between the ocean and the land surface, the monsoon becomes stronger when you have this stronger radiative forcing. And so that's what's depicted here, is that when the land is heating up relative to the ocean, you get a stronger monsoonal forcing. 
And so if you were able to go back in time, the, the, the thought exercise is that roughly every 20,000 years, if you go to subtropical Africa or another monsoonal region such as Southeast Asia, that you should be seeing the occurrence of one of these humid events, one of these wet events, paced at a roughly 20,000 year beat, going back in time. And the reason that we know this is so was uh, initially uh, inspired by piston coring in the, in the Mediterranean Sea, but really it's the application of scientific ocean drilling that has just broken open our knowledge about how African climate has changed in the past. Because Africa is so poor in continuous and long records uh, that we can get from uh, terrestrial sequences, uh, the oceans provide uh, a way to look at the the climate evolution of the continent remotely. So this shows one example of what you would see if you cored in the eastern Mediterranean Sea. So these are, uh, this is one core length that's roughly about 9.6 meters long or 10 meters long. It's cut into sections. This is the top of the section. That's the bottom of the section. It's about one and a half meters long. And this base of the core would attach to the top of that core, and if you can mentally string that together, you'll see that what, you've, what you see in the Eastern Med is this thing that looks for all the world like a barcode. You go from black to white to black to white to black to white, and so what is this? Well, the white is very easy. The white is a nanofossil ooze, so it's a, it's, an ooze, it's a marine sediment that's largely composed of the calcareous fossils of marine algae and of, 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 of animals as well. Um, foraminifera. And then these dark intervals are what we call sapropels. And the sapropels, they're dark because they're so rich in organic carbon. They can comprise up to 2, 3, even up to 10 percent organic carbon, which are very high numbers for marine sediments. And so this pacing of, of organic rich, organic poor, organic rich going back and forth, if we look at the pacing of these, these are roughly every 20,000 years or so. And what's the, 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 the cause of, these, uh, of the sapropel events is mainly due to anoxia, the occurrence of low oxygen conditions in the eastern Mediterranean when the, the Nile River outflow out to the eastern Mediterranean capped the, the eastern Mediterranean surface and prevented convection of deep waters and allowed the deep ocean to stagnate. And so anyone who's had a goldfish tank gone away for the weekend and lost their air pump knows exactly what we're talking about. This is this marine organic matter at the bottom of the fishbowl, if you will. What's really impressive is that this pacing, this orbital pacing of these wet-dry cycles, goes back for millions of years, unbroken. Every 20,000 years, one of, these, one of these sapropel layers is laid down. And you can see this kind of bundling, these, uh, these individual layers here, for example, are the sapropels, one individual 20,000-year cycle. And you'll see they're bundled in groups of three or four. And the reason for that is that orbital precession is modulated, is amplified and diminished by the longer period of orbital variability, which is eccentricity. That's the, the degree to which the Earth shifts from being a circular orbit to one that's more eccentric or more oval-shaped. And that impacts the, or that regulates the impact of precession, such that you'll have stronger monsoons during these periods, weaker monsoons during the white intervals. And so this is, an, this is a photograph actually taken from a bar in Sicily uh, by Fritz Hilgen. This is 9 million years old. This is 8 million years old. This is a marine sediment sequence that's been uplifted to form this beautiful vista for the bar, just for our enjoyment. And this is just an amazing sequence of these sapropel events that go back, this is just documenting one million years of this, but this goes back throughout the entire neogene. So the conclusion that we draw from this is that there have been these regular wet-dry cycles that have swept over subtropical Africa, paced every 20,000 years, going back for millions and millions of years. Martin Trouth and Mark Maslin uh, published a series of papers, one most recently that sort of summarizes their most recent results, where they've turned their attention to East Africa. So East Africa is an interesting place to work, not only because that's where we find the hominin fossils, but it's also where, because of the, the rifting location, we have lake basins that form and disappear and reform over time because of the deformation of the Earth's surface. When there's a basin to be filled, you can have a lake sediment sequence. What's impressive is that 
of the entire stratigraphic succession in East Africa, only about 10% of the sediments there are actually lacustrine. So even though it's a, even though it's a, a, a lake environment, you think of the, the East African uh, rift lakes, lake sediments are only representing 10% of the stratigraphic section there. And the reason why is because it's a dynamically active area. When there's a basin, you get a lake. When there's not a basin, you don't get a lake. But you can only get a lake when it's wet. And it's wet during these periods here, roughly a million years ago, 1.8 million years ago. They argue that these are these periods where you see this, this uh, accumulation of lake sediments uh, occurring over this time frame. What they're seeing here is this uh, interval here of these are this uh, barcode going back over the sapropels over the last four and a half million years, and this is the orbital eccentricity plot. You can see that there are these bundles roughly every um, uh, pace by 100,000 year periods. This is just the most recent one, about 10,000 years ago, when Lake Turkana was about 50 meters higher than today um, uh, during the early Holocene. So 50 meters higher just during one of these cycles, you can get an idea of just how much wetter it was. So the long-term shift here uh, uh, toward more open arid conditions comes from an entirely different uh, uh, source of information. And this is this, uh, this, this notion that when you have sort of your mind's eye of East African climate or East African vegetation today, for many of us, this is the image that's brought to us. Roughly 75% of East Africa is carpeted by these arid adapted C4 grasslands. And this is what defines, let's say, the modern Serengeti today. So this has not always been true. And uh, Sarah Fekins gave a, a wonderful talk on this this morning at the session that was available this morning. This has not always been true. In fact, as we step back further in time, there's clearly evidence for more music or wetter conditions as we go back in time. So the key question is, when did that happen? Why did it happen? And uh, you know, how profound were the landscape modifications at this time? So it's a great question to ask, well, how can we know this? Well, we take advantage of the fact that C3 and C4 vegetation, two different uh, 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 floral anatomies that have different biochemical pathways have very distinct growing space between atmospheric CO2 and daytime temperature. C4 grasslands perfor, per, uh, were actually, they evolved at the, uh, at the end of the Oligocene and expanded globally in the late Miocene because of the rise of, in, of biomes that had increasingly dry and very warm conditions and under lower CO2, low carbon dioxide environments. And this is just a map of where C4 vegetation comprises 60 to 100 percent of, uh, of the flora uh, for the continent of Africa. You can see this sort of big red blotch here that uh, is dominating these, where the grasslands are dominant today. So what we're going to do is that one could rely on pollen, and, but pollen is difficult because it's, it's, a, it's hard to dis discriminate between C3 and C4 uh, vegetation sources, um, and also pollen has their own limitations in terms of how they can be interpreted. So uh, based on some really pioneering work by Terry Serling and Jim Elringer, there's been this new application of this idea of using stable carbon isotopes as a way to track the C3, C4 pathway vegetation changes over time. And so we're going to be using this tool uh, quite a bit in the, in the next few minutes. So just a brief overview of those of you who are, who are not chemists um, is that the, the, there are two stable isotopes of carbon, uh, one unstable radio, uh, radioactive uh, isotope, carbon-14, which I'm not showing here. Carbon-12 has six protons and six neutrons. Carbon-13 has one extra neutron, and so the mass is one AMU higher. The most abundant form of carbon, 99 percent, is, is carbon-12 and roughly 1% of the pool globally is, is carbon-13. And we denote changes in the fractionation between the heavier isotope carbon-13 and carbon-12 using this equation. Basically, it's, it's just a way of expressing how the ratio changes relative to an accepted international standard. And so we can refer all of our numbers when we get these ratios to a known standard. So the actual physical number means something in, a relative, in, a, in an absolute term. So this is where the power of using carbon isotopes to discern changes in, in vegetation come to bear. 
So this is the carbon isotope uh, ratio measured in per mil. So these are in parts per thousand deviation from the standard. A zero deviation means it's identical to the standard. When it's more negative, minus 10 is actually a 1% difference, minus 20 is a 2% is a difference, and so on. What we see is that C3 plants, which are trees, shrubs, and some herbs, um, have a very negative carbon isotopic signature that results from their photosynthetic pathway where the first uh, uh, compound, the first carbon compound that's made is, consists of a, of a three carbon compound. C4 plants, which have this adaptation for more open, uh, so for uh, more, uh, for warmer and drier environments and low CO2 environments, are much more enriched by about 12 per mil uh, and the, 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 these populations are very distinct, and so it allows us to discriminate between C3 environments, which include trees and shrubs and herbs, and C4 plants, which in these tropical environments is principally uh, uh, savanna grasslands. So before I continue, this work has really been led by many people, and, I, and I'll subtract myself from this. Uh, we really owe a debt of gratitude to Turi Serling and his uh, acolyte, Naomi Levin, who together have generated just tremendous volumes of data from East Africa, from the same uh, exposures that possess the fossil record of human evolution. And so we have this opportunity now to really understand how the vegetation changes uh, when they occurred in East Africa and how they're related to the hominin fossil changes over the same time period. So this is a summary actually from uh, Naomi Levin's paper in 2001, which is a compilation of dozens of authors of, of uh, dozens of individual studies of, of carbon isotopes. It's roughly about 3,000 analyses spanning the last four and a half million years. And again, I'm showing this eccentricity curve here, which is just a proxy for the pacing of these wet dry cycles. This is the banding, this uh, barcode, if you will, depicting the rapidity and regular, re regularity of these wet-dry cycles, with the blue intervals being these lake intervals in East Africa. And then this is showing the carbon isotope data from a set of linked sites extending from Ethiopia, which is known as the Shangura, and in the Turkana, both east and west Turkana of northern Kenya, and then in Tanzania, it's, it's the Olduvai site. And so all these data were, are shown here in orange, and what I've done here is just bin average them uh, in, in increments to show the mean and the standard deviation over time. So there's quite a bit of difference between sites, and so that's one of the things, the challenges here is that the local uh, topography and the local uh, uh, meteorology of, of each site has changed quite a bit. But over this time frame, there's this dramatic shift toward heavier isotopic values which indicates a shift toward increasingly C4 vegetation. So the interpretation that, that Turi and Naomi have put upon this is that there's a shift from more mesic conditions, certainly not forested, certainly not forested, but a shift toward uh, from a wooded grassland, so something that's about uh, between 40 and 25% um, uh, uh, canopy cover, to something that moved more toward the savanna grasslands today of something less than 10 percent uh, uh, canopy cover for, for trees. So a second development that has really transformed this particular field, this particular question, has been the application of fossil molecules derived from plant waxes as a way to go after this vegetation question. As I mentioned, going after pollen or pollen reconstructions are plagued by many problems, one of which is preservation, and the other is representativeness of interpretation of the, of the pollen diagrams from the individual areas. What the, what the plant wax uh, biomolecules allow us to do is to make these same reconstructions of C3 versus C4 abundance over time, but using a different proxy and uh, one that's actually now showing to be very widely uh, applicable. So this is a, a cross-section of, a, of a, a grass leaf and in here these hairs are covered with an epicuticular wax that allows or helps all higher plants to retain water. So it, it, it protects them from abrasion and it also allows them to, to um, restrict their water loss. These waxes 
can be extracted in marine sediments, in lake sediments, in soil sediments, in sediments that are ancient sediments over time, these, uh, these plant wax molecules are basically molecular fossils that stem or that were established at the time of deposition of the sediments. And they're relatively uh, insulated from, bio, um, from degradation. So these alkanoic acids actually come in many different compound classes of carbon chains of 24, 26, 28, and 30. And this characteristic image that you see here from a, from a gas chromatograph uh, shows this odd over even preference that shouts to the user, I am a plant wax, measure me. So this is uh, our lab here. There's uh, uh, Billy D'Andrea and, um, and John here in front of the mass spec at Lamont. And uh, at this point, I really have to acknowledge that um, at Lamont Doherty, we built a new lab uh, with uh, Pradiga Polisar and Billy D'Andrea that is just absolutely fantastic. It's remarkably productive. And through uh, Billy and Pradiga alone, there's something like 30 abstracts submitted uh, through, from the products of this lab. And so I really have to give a shout out to them on just uh, establishing a really great research group. <coughs> so when Sarah Fekins was, uh, was at Lamont, she uh, took this approach and applied it to the one drill site that we have from the Gulf of Aden. We're going to return here in a moment because there's an interesting story. But Sarah took this uh, upon herself and, and uh, worked with Tim Eglinton at Woods Hole to extract these plant wax compounds from Site 231 in the Gulf of Aden, drilled by the, um, by the deep sea drilling program well over 30 years ago. Suffice to say, we would love to go back to this place. I actually have a proposal into the Gulf of Aden with the ocean drilling program. It's actually the highest ranked proposal in the system and it'll never get drilled because it's completely unsafe to do any science there. But this just gives you an idea and I'm going to show you in a moment what you can get from this. We actually took this up to the Navy and said, well, can't you just give us an escort? You know, we'll, we can just have the ship there and you can just do circles around us while we drill. <laughs> and, and the response back was this wonderfully measured pause. He says, do you have any idea what our day rate is? <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, uh, you know, staff, being a, a, a chief scientist for that cruise and trying to staff it would be another, would be another challenge. But that's, uh, needless to say, I'm going to try to make the case to you that I just wish we could have a kumbaya moment and all work together because this is just such an incredible archive from this site. So what Sarah did was to measure individual sections that actually contained tephra layers where you could correlate these sediments directly to the hominin sites because the fossil record of hominin evolution is largely constrained by, by tephra layers. And what she discovered was that at this sort of orbital scale, there are these large scale remodelings of about 30% C3, C4 oscillations going between relatively grassier times and less grassy times. So the landscape remodelling at the orbital scale is as large as the long-term trend toward increasing grasslands. And that was a discovery that, we, that, that she put on the map for the first time. And it's important because it gives us an idea of just how profound these landscape remodelings were at the time when our human ancestors were doing their business on the East African Plains. So Sarah has since gone on to generate quite a bit more data uh, with, her, with, her, with her team at, at um, at USC, and so what she sees here is a similar increase in the carbon isotopes, again peaking sometime around two million years ago, is the first time we have C4 grasslands that are comparable to what we see today. There have been times in the past, um, earlier than this, around five or, five or so million years ago, when there were high C C4 uh, grassland extents as well, but the, the occurrence of uh, the, the maximum extent of C4 grasses, of these arid adapted grasses, comes in sometime around two million years ago. So I wrote a paper in Scientific American, um, that was an experience unto itself, uh, in just, just a couple of months ago, and for those of you who are interested, you can go ahead and read this, but I decided to use their figure because they have such a great art uh, department there. So this is this representation of the human family tree, this is Homo, this is Nutcracker Man or, or, the, uh, or Paranthropus lineage, and this would be Lucy. This is this sort of Y pattern I was telling you about. And in gray are the depictions of these intervals of greater um, uh, of, of, of faunal change in, in East Africa. 
And you can see both from Sarah's data and from the soil carbonate data, there's a shift that occurs right about this time where the C4 grasses expand at this time and they reach maximum representation after about two million years ago. Now there's been a really, really fascinating discovery that's actually just came online just uh, in the last year or so. And again, this was led by Turi Serling, but also with Matt Sponheimer, where they were able to uh, access, after a lot of uh, negotiation and a lot of trust building, they were able to access analysis of hominin teeth themselves. Because this connection between, between climate and life on this time scale is purely coincidental at this point. All we know is that at the time of some of these faunal changes, we have changes in vegetation that are consistent with the biotic changes that we see. What Turi was able to show for the first time is that if you measure the carbon isotopic composition of the tooth enamel of these fossil hominins, they're tracking the vegetation. You are what you eat. They're tracking the vegetation. So what? The one group that isn't doing this is us. These blue guys are early homo. And in a, in a landscape that's becoming increasingly inflexible, increasingly pegged at C4 vegetation, up to 85%, homo is doing something different. At the same time when Paranthropus, and we know what happened to them, chose a distinctly C4 diet path. We went to one that was more mixed. And that, all we know is that we're the ones who emerged from that, that, that time period intact. So to summarize this, the climate and hominin evolution story, I'd say that the current views right now um, are that climate varied continuously. There are these wet, dry cycles that persisted for millions and millions of years. Superimposed on that is this long-term drying trend, the timing of which coincides, uh, the appearance and the amplification of it coincide with these two clusters of hominin speciation. The biggest thing that I would tell, that I do tell media when they talk about this is that at the moment, really what we have is coincidence, yet the, f the fossil tooth evidence that we have really uh, points to a connection between humans and their environment and their use of diet or the signature of diet as an indication of how they interacted with this changing landscape. So the meme at the moment is that Homo is defined as having a flexible diet from an increasingly inflexible landscape. And I use this as a plug that there's more to come soon because Andy Cohen and Rick Potts at the Smithsonian Institution now have uh, been, they've just completed drilling several Paleo Lakes basins in East Africa with the explicit intent of trying to develop longer and more detailed lake records from the hominin sites themselves to try to reconstruct climate on the ground as it were. So with this, I'd like to segue into the uh, culture and climate section. Um, and I'm going to give myself some water. And uh, this is oh, five. OK, good. And uh, in this case, I really became interested in the African humid period some time ago, in part because it's just a phenomenal time period. We have evidence for much greater lake uh, intervals here. Between five and 15,000 years ago, this is uh, the Oxford Lake Level Database from North Africa, and this is the orbital precession forcing. And you can see there's a pretty good correspondence between when there were lakes in East Africa and uh, when they were high. And Jess Tierney has done a really beautiful map of plotting this here. Wherever you see green is a high lake interval. So the questions for this are, are three, and some of them are really quite short, is that when we look at these lake intervals, did African climate change quickly or did it change slowly? And this has become a, a small sort of cottage industry in, in this particular discipline with camps sort of falling on either side. And I think we've got now a way to, to unify our views on this. Also, did all of Africa become wet at the same time? In other words, was the whole place wet or were there some regional variations? We now have new data, uh, actually some new unpublished data that I'll be showing today. Uh, that speak to this directly. And then lastly, which I think is one of the most compelling, interesting cases, if any of you ever need a poster child example of whether people care about climate change, this is the study. 
So was the end of the African humid period fast or slow? This is Lake Yoa in northeast Chad, and it shows where it is. It's right in the middle of the desert today. And it's a very fair question to ask, what's a lake doing in the middle of a place that has three meters of, of evaporation per year water imbalance? This shows this location. This is Stefan Kropelin, who's led this study. It's in the middle of a desert. The reason why it's here is because it's fed by groundwaters. It's amazing because it's a laminated sequence that's very well dated. And so Stefan and his team measured the pollen grains in this particular core. And the tropical plant taxa are shown here in these green and blue colors. And you can see that they're present until about 5,000 years ago. And then over a period of several thousand years, it's only after several thousand years that the Saharan plant taxa appear at this particular site. And so they're arguing that there was a very gradual transition in vegetation at this time based on these pollen data. Uh, Sayu Waldeb has also just published a study looking at the Nile and came to a similar conclusion. So there are many sites across Africa that would indicate these sort of gradual transitions that look like the orbital insulation forcing. Something that we discovered now 14 years ago, looking at a, a sediment core off of West Africa, ODP site 658, which is underneath this dust plume from the Sahara today, is that when you look at the concentration of the dust over time in this particular core, which has very high accumulation rates and it's pretty well dated, is that the onset of the humid period and the end of the humid period around 5,000 years ago were really fast. They occurred within uh, a couple of centuries at most. And including the, uh, uh, the younger Dryas as well. And so the conclusion we drew from this marine core was really quite different from what Stefan had concluded. We see that it's being a very, a, a very abrupt transition. So we proposed and were funded by the National Science Foundation to lead a cruise from Lisbon to Senegal. And actually, we didn't make it to Senegal because our generator exploded. So we limped into, into uh, the Cape Verde Islands, not before I begged the captain to take a core again. Um, but we have this transect of sediment cores along this region that we can use to test these questions about how widespread and how abrupt the transitions were. To do this, we're going to be looking at these yellow core sites. This is work that actually began with Jess Adkins when he was a postdoc at, at Lamont. And yes, Jess did do a postdoc. Uh, we, we had a, uh, we had, he had this application of using uh, thorium normalized particle fluxes as a way to actually reconstruct changes in the rain of these aeolian-derived sediments to the seafloor. And the idea is that seawater uranium decays to 230 thorium. 230 thorium is insoluble and will then attach itself to particles. And so one can measure the, um, the isotopes of uranium and thorium in the sediments and reconstruct the sediment uh, uh, change, uh, reconstruct the sediment particle fluxes. And David McGee uh, actually worked on these sediment cores that we collected and showed that there are these low dust fluxes off of northwest Africa during this period here known as the African humid period, going all the way up from Morocco all the way down to Senegal. So it's really like a barn door closing. It was wet for, for about uh, from 15 to 5,000 years ago, and then boom, it dried up again, in some cases very abruptly. This work is really uh, a multi-group effort from Jess Adkins and David McGee at MIT, Jan Bernd Stutt, and Gisela Winkler. And the modern dust fluxes are two to five times higher than the African humid period. So it was really clear sky conditions during the African humid period off of West Africa. So now I'm going to focus on uh, using hydrogen isotopes as a proxy of vegetation changes. And this is actually a shout out to Gabe, uh, to Gabe Bowen, uh, who has this water isotope site. Due to the amount effect, we have much lighter isotopes uh, uh, in the rainy regions, and so we can s track past changes in, veg in, in rainfall. So we're now returning to the Gulf of Aden, and we had a cruise here with Gerald Gonson under a Dutch flag, where three months before 9-11, we collected these sediment cores. These are not sediment cores. These are actually pirate attack sites. <laughs> and what's amazing is the record that Jess recovered from this site showing this really abrupt, rapid wetting up of, of, the, of the Horn of Africa during the African humid period. And these transitions that she found were on the order of two centuries, very, very fast. And she deserves a little medal because she's a McElwain awardee this year, a big medal, in fact. 
So was the African humid period synchronous everywhere? No. Again, if we look at it over time, um, sorry, if we look at it over time, there's the orbital precession curve. This is site 65A, where it ends at 5,000 years ago. Tim Shanahan just published, or his published paper coming out in Science, in, uh, sorry, in Nature Geoscience in January, shows that it occurred much later, around two to 3,000 years ago, at Lake Basumtui, which is much further south. So it's a time transgressive end of the African humid period. And indeed, if you get all of the data together for North Africa, they clearly show this time transgressive trend. So it was gradually and over a very regional area, but it was locally abrupt. And Jess has shown this really very clearly for hydrogen isotopes for these same core suites that we have off West Africa. So now I'm going to return to this. We're, we're finishing up right now. I, I appreciate your time. If we look at the uh, signature of the African humid period in, uh, in North Africa, we see these beautiful evidence for, uh, for uh, uh, petroglyphs and, and, and etchings that document a time that is very different than today. <coughs> these are sites from uh, Gobero in, in, uh, near the western lake of Lake Chad. There are these organized burial sites. This is a mother with her two children buried what we believe on a bed of flowers. So <clears throat> the population dynamics of the site have been looked at by a, a, a pair of uh, archaeologists. And what they found is that the depopulation of North Africa occurred very rapidly, again, around 5,000 years ago. So the story is that after 5,000 years ago, when North Africa was completely populated, as it dried up, the populations moved, and they moved east to where there's permanent water, the Nile. And what's impressive, and I'm coming to the end right here, is that roughly 300 years after the occurrence of this depopulation of North Africa, we see the appearance of organized, stratified urban culture along the Nile. In particular, the Narmur palette, which is a, from this time period of around 5,000 years ago, depicts the unification of northern and southern uh, Egypt. So this is the first time that we see this organized, stratified urban culture depicting Narmer, um, who's the king of the, of the south, who invades the north and actually uh, then takes on the, the headdress of the, of the north. And uh, there's symbols throughout this that just document lots of dead people. <laughs> and uh, I, I would use this as my final slide as a way of saying that um, African climate uh, has changed in the past, and I would submit that climate change has changed in the past, and it's shaped us, who we are, physically, behaviorally, culturally. And we are shaping our present and our future climate. And I really speak to you as a, as a community of people who have been very patient, and also as a way of uh, encouraging us all to find ways to communicate our results to the larger public through coordination with earth and social science folks. So thank you very much. Uh, sorry, we have to cut because there's another lecture coming in and uh, we're already, they're threatening to pull the microphones. Uh, I, I really want to appreciate, it was a great talk, Peter. I'm sorry, you just don't have time. And I want also to thank the uh, selection committee and the secretary for Matt Schmidt from the PP uh, focus group. Thanks.